welcome back. You're watching Stockwatch with me, Julieta Televi, and joining me to take your questions this evening are Jared Houston from All Weather Capital and Gary Boyson from Rand Swiss. If you'd like to send questions, please email stockwatch at bdtv.co.za or via SMS on 41392. Uh, Gary, Jared, it's good to see you both there this evening. Jared, if I may start with you, it was a pretty flat close overall for the JSE today, but within that, of course, there were some fairly pronounced moves. Um, <clears throat> and you had the results, or at least trading updates from Northam uh, and results from Amplatz. The Northam share price um, took a bit of a knock today. Do you think the market thought that they were going to be the one company that um, emerged relatively unscathed from the downturn affecting PGM players? Or how would you attribute that fall? I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, Northern pretty much uh, thought of as a place to hide within the PGM space at the moment, just, just given clearly the, the downturn in prices and the pressure that's caused on cash flows across the sector. So the numbers were missed on, on expectation and certainly on our numbers, more pronounced uh, on the bottom line than on the top line. But you can see clear strain I mean, with the quantum of earnings decline uh, coming through with the pricing. So I, th I think it was a bit of that. Uh, and then people starting to have another look at the balance sheets of these companies and realize the stress potentially that the businesses are under that caused a bit of a fall. That, that and a bit of consensus uh, hiding in the stock perhaps caused the, the size mm -hmm. of the stock move. Gary, if you had to look at Northam and uh, Amplatz, uh, is it fair to compare two companies on, on their, on their uh, I suppose, the one is a cash profit margin, the one was an EBITDA margin. So I guess within that there might be some difference. But for example, um, the EBITDA margin, I think, or the, no, sorry, the cash profit margin for Amplatz was 35%. For Northam, it's 28%. I mean, does that just tell you what you need to know, that this one company is works at better margins, therefore it's the, the better bets, i.e. Amplatz, or is that too simplistic? I think I think you've got to look at the underlying assets. You've got to look at the underlying businesses as well. I think I think maybe it's a little bit too simplistic. And, and I think also looking looking at what Amplatz is going to have to do uh, today. I mean, I think it's going to be a very different business in the next couple of years, and that's got to factor into your valuation as well. I mean, they're talking about laying off seventeen percent of their workforce. That's that's a totally different company um, in a few years' time, and 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 that and that has to feed into your thinking. You, yeah, I don't think you can just look at the you know like what one line on the income statement and kind of draw too many conclusions between between the companies. And uh, you know, I kind of I can feel full sorry for both companies because you know you know when you look at look at like a PGM miners like this obviously there's huge operating leverage when when prices go up in 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 the PGM basket you know that that money just drops straight from revenue to, into into the bottom line of the you know and and it's wonderful uh, but the same works in reverse and 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 when and when platinum prices are suppressed when you have a structural change within the industry I mean I was looking at at, at uh, Amplatz's numbers and I mean you know they they almost halved in in precious metal sales to to Asia they actually did okay in the US and and Europe was also not too bad at, at, at it's slumped, but the U.S. actually managed to grow. But mm. you know, when you have a structural change in an industry like this, it comes down to you know, how efficiently can you cost, cut, uh, cut costs? You know, how can you restructure your business? And, and that's going to be crucial for both companies. And, and, and that'll change one line on the income statement very, very quickly um, as those restructurings take place. I mean, it's pretty brutal and it's horrible because it's people's jobs and their livelihoods that are being affected now here. Um, Jared, uh, you say that you, uh, you were maybe um, a bit wrong-footed by Northern. Does that suggest that you actually do have investments in PGM players? Um, because the big question that we get uh, just about every show is, when is the bottom uh, for these companies? Do you think it's in place yet? I, you know, I mean, I, I'm not one to pretend that I can call the bottom of the cycle uh, in the PGM minus yet. It's particularly difficult. We, we don't have exposure in our funds at present. I think just, I mean, there's a very difficult backdrop and negative outlook at the moment. So I think we're probably waiting for uh, positive signs. I mean, one clear positive sign is when we do see uh, supply come out of the market to impact prices positively. And I think you probably need to see one or two uh, more um, you know, perhaps more struggles in the sector for, for that to actually take place. And I don't think we're quite there yet. I mean, it was positive, as Gary mentioned, to see some cost cutting I mean, further pullbacks on CapEx to preserve, to preserve balance sheets. We actually need to see supply come out of the market or, or some shift in demand to actually move prices mm -hmm. to the point where these companies will generate positive free cash flow. But for us, I mean, it is difficult to invest with a negative free cash flow outlook and no obvious sign of it improving in the short term. Yeah. Gary, you're nodding there. Same conclusion for the time being. 
Those are, it's a very, very, I mean, if you look at it, yeah, like I said, the a structural change within within the, the, the space as well. I mean, autocatalytic converters account for a huge amount of platinum demand. I mean, you know, the, the kind of swing comes through from, from Japanese buying, which I think has been decreasing just because, you know, when they, the metal isn't performing from an investment point of view, you don't want to go out and buy, you know, platinum-based ETFs, for example. But, I mean, th there's a huge, huge risk around the rollout uh, of, of EVs. And, uh, you know, unless you see a big change, and I'm not saying that you can't see a big change in, in the picture, but it's it's difficult to see without the cost, cost cutting. You know how these play, how these players become attractive for investors in the short term. But uh, I suppose if you could, the share prices would be a lot higher as well. Sure. Okay. Uh, one uh, viewer has sent in a question talking about his JSC portfolio worst performers, and he says, and and these are quite interesting because they're all what you would regard as sort of blue chip names, um, and they are Bidvest, Mondi, and Ninety One. And he says, I've held for some time, so I'd be, I suppose I'd be quite curious as to when they were bought. Um, what are the prospects for these stocks over the next three years that would still motivate a hold or a buy? Um, Gary, sticking with you. Okay, uh, maybe, maybe, we'll start, yeah, maybe we'll start with Bidvest, because okay. um, I suppose Bidvest has had a, a, a latter day wobble, um, certainly from about October, November last year. Um, do you think it's going to come right and within a three year period? Yeah, I well, I don't know. Within a three-year period, I mean, timing is always very, very difficult, and it's, it'll be really interesting to hear when when the investor bought uh, in, into the counter as well. But uh, you know, Bitvest has actually done exceptionally well for us. So, so the, the wobble that you're talking about is about a 10% correction. Uh, that's not not massive in, in in a stock's life. You should easily be able to ride out a 10% 10, 10 correction. I mean, Bitvest is kind of a, a holding, but I mean, I think we also got our timing pretty pretty good on on Bitvest. Um, looking at it, Bidvest, you're essentially betting on a, on a recovery in the, in the South African market. You, you, you know, it's, it's so integral to the South African economy. You need the economy to perform. And it is difficult to see, see where that's, coming, uh, that's going to come from just you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a more of a macro tailwind. But but it is an incredibly well-run business. You know they 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 are very very savvy at what they do, and that's and that's why you know even in difficult a difficult environment in South Africa they can still they can still perform. You know is it better to have Bidvest or to go and buy you know the Magnificent Seven? You know yeah sure it would have been much better to go buy Nvidia five years ago, but but you know as as a local as a local strategy and if it's within your thinking, to, I mean maybe it's a portfolio in an RA or there's some reason that you've got uh, you know South African portfolio. I think I think Bidvest deserves a position in there, I really do. Yeah. Uh, um, Jared, of course, um, <clears throat> when you talk about the worst performer in a portfolio, and I know this uh, particular viewer has quite a few US shares, so um, it might be an unfair comparison uh, between Bidvest and NVIDIA, say. Um, and so it might not actually be that Bidvest has produced negative returns. Um, but would you agree that, well, if you had a choice, I, I guess, of you know, the stocks in the uh, in a world basket, would you, would you put Bid Bidvest in there? You know, I, I think it's always difficult to compare, I mean, stocks a, a, across different regions and different sectors with completely different exposures. But, but I, I think, I mean, you have to evaluate everyone on its merit. And I agree with Gary's comments. I mean, Bidvest is a very well-run industrial conglomerate, I mean, with, with excellent management teams across the different divisions. I mean, clearly it's got a great track record of execution, both in terms of the operating businesses as well as capital allocation. So, I mean, I, I agree. I think it deserves a place in the portfolio. It's just about relative opportunity. I mean, at the moment, SA Inc. Is de has been derated quite significantly over a number of years. We are spoiled for choice in terms of your, your similar type exposures. So I suppose it's just about relative price and where you see the best opportunity in that set. Um, Jared, sticking with you, what about Mondi? Um, I think Mondi has been a bit of a fraught investment for a few people over the last two years, maybe. Um, so what would you do? Would you hold it if you if you do own it, um, buy more or or dump it? Yeah, my, my is not one I'm particularly close to, but I, but I would say I mean it's another business that has been affected by some macro factors within the business set, and then some structural issues uh, on the demand side that's also challenged some of the pricing it's been able to realise. I mean the recent stock move and pullback was was on some concerns about a potential acquisition the company could could have done. The market getting a little bit concerned about that type of activity in, in, in this environment caused it to pull back, but I'm not uh, particularly close to, to the Monday case. Okay. Um, Gary, how about you? Do you look at Monday at all? Uh, we do, do look at Monday. Um, 
again yeah like uh like jared was saying i mean i think you know so, some some macro factors specifically about the, the the russian assets recently maybe took a little bit of the uh the excitement off mondi which had been a, a fairly good performer it was seen as kind of a, like a staple rand hedge that you'd stick in a portfolio you got you're going to get the weakening currency as well feed it feeding into the numbers which is always great um and i think you know when when you know they have to write down the russian assets i think everyone had to have a, a really good look at what was inside mondi and look at their geographic experience and just say like, oh, great, it's a locally listed rand hedge, but what are we actually buying? And I think that that's a question that a lot of people are asking themselves at the moment. They're, they're looking at things like British American Tobacco, for example, and saying, yeah, great, it's a big multinational company, but um, but are we in a twilight industry here? Like, should we really be holding this just because it's, it's you know, we, we expect a currency weakening or is there not a better way of going about it? So, um, yeah, looking at Mondi, I mean, you know, very, very mixed from like a consensus uh, Kind of uh, expectation point of view. I mean, we, you know, if you look at uh, where consensus is at the moment, just on a stock price level, you're looking at around 22% upside from here. So, yeah, pro probably worth having in the portfolio. A yeah, little pullback that we've seen at the moment, but uh, if I look out, you'd expect money to kind of grow revenue, you, you know, so, sort of up a single digits, and um, that's that's decent. And and I think that the business has been through a tough time. And I think a lot of businesses have been through a tough time recently, and I think that that also gives them an opportunity to be a lot more efficient. So if we go into to a slightly more benign economic environment, I think the stock price could potentially perform very, very well, um, especially okay. when you're looking at like a trailing 12 month PE of around nine. It's it's not particularly expensive. Yeah. And the last one is 91. Um, Jared, is 91 just purely a play on world stock markets or the JSE? Because 91 has got vast interests outside of South Africa. Um, so <laughs> is it, well, yeah, what is it a proxy for? Um, and why would you buy yeah, it? I yeah, I, I think 91 is a very, very good business. I mean, obviously, there's, there's an element of the business or pretty much all the business that's market dependent, uh, different exposures. I mean, half the business is offshore and there's a bias towards emerging markets uh, rather than developed. And then, I mean, obviously, the South African overweight component within its portfolio. But it is very well run. I mean, in the last couple of uh, reporting periods, you've seen a little bit of a stumble in terms of asset gathering. So a bit of net outflows in the business. Now, it has been a growth story uh, since it's come to market. And, and really, the ambition is to grow the business quite significantly over time. At the moment, there are clearly flow pressures for emerging markets as well as South Africa. In us being in a business, know how difficult it is to attract uh, active uh, assets in this space, particularly in emerging markets. So yeah. specific factors hurting the industry that's hurt them on the flow side. And then the market's just offering no support to beats at the moment. We think it's a type of business, obviously heavily geared to improving markets and sentiment, very well run business. Uh, so one be positive on particularly if you see a little bit of uptick in the markets. Gary, what are your thoughts there? Would you be patient enough holding them? Um, I suppose you get a dividend out of them if nothing else, <laughs> if, uh, if markets don't do anything spectacular. I mean, but would you hold a, a 91 just for the dividend? Which some of us did were for coronation until they, of course, they had a run in with the tax man. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, listen, it is a, it is a chunky dividend yield at the moment. So, so looking at uh, you know last twelve months, I mean, you're sitting on seven point three two percent dividend yield, and uh, you know I wouldn't expect that to move too much unless you you really see a the stock price shoot the lights out. In which case, hey, your dividend yield's lower, but at least your stock price shot the lights out. So, um, yeah, I think you know. Looking, looking at it, I think Jared is 100% right. Um, I mean, it has been a tough period for for the business as well. So I was just kind of catching up on the AUM in in the first half. I mean, they they they, they the AUM decreased around seven percent. Um, I mean, the net inflows as well also fell. So, you know, a, a tough. I think it's a, a difficult environment to attract assets. Absolutely, um, I think 91. If I think of it, I mean, we work with with you know all, all the big lisps as well. I mean, I, th I think they, they've got like great technology. They've they've got good products. I think you know where their their sweet maybe for for South Africa certainly is lagging a little bit. Um, is just what they can do in the offshore space. Uh, as Jared also mentioned, active management is is always a, a, a little bit more tricky. You know, specifically in this environment where you have just such a, a huge. Um, 
huge success in some of the passives, and and that's uh, you know, their platform not particularly geared towards towards passive ma uh, passive management either. Um, but of course, you know, obviously a big a big chunk of the revenue also coming from the UK, uh, UK economy. You know, also what in a technical recession at the moment. So also I think you know operating in a, a difficult environment. So I mean, on 2023 numbers, I've got 67 percent of their revenue coming from there. So um, yeah, diff I think I think difficult, but but probably if I was holding 91, I, I would keep holding 91 at this stage. I think you you probably potentially have a good entry point and if you do see a, a little bit of a recovery in markets that should feed straight through into into the um into the underlying business so yeah i would hold on yeah okay all right um what about city lodge um jared going back to you what does the panel think about city lodge hotels i'm very curious to see their six month reporting uh or results which should be released within this month what do they need to report in order for the stock to rally above five rand or even head towards the six rand mark uh, well, ho hopefully, good numbers will go some way towards uh, to, towards achieving that. I, I, I think, I mean, we've got a generally positive view across the hospitality sector. I mean, if you just think about, I mean, this was a space heavily impacted by COVID, and you've started to see a gradual recovery, both in terms of travel and tourism, as well as uh, business travel and conference activity, pick up quite nicely. So, us sitting here in Cape Town at the moment, I mean, it's very uh, anecdotally visible the number of conferences that have happened in the last few weeks, as well mm -hmm. as obviously the airport and hotel so you can see that in you know, occupancy trends are all moving in the right direction as well as uh, room prices so I, I think the underlying trends are improving across that space city lodge is very well run well placed business and it'll benefit both from the tourism as well as the uh, business travel spend so we like that as well as the broader space and, and the other names in the area as well um in terms of the viewer specific questions though um is the market going to be looking for um, occupancy levels at a certain percentage? So I, and I, I'm trying to remember what they were in the last set of results. I think they were in the, what, the 50 odd percent? Yeah, um, it's, it's generally, I mean, these types of businesses are quite geared to marginal occupancy. And what, once you go above the 60% level, the impact on the bottom line is quite pronounced. So you mean that additional revenue that you get almost comes through the bottom line because there are a huge element of fixed costs in the businesses. If you just think about how a hotel operates, I mean, you've got your staff that is variable, but a lot of your building costs and, and that stay fixed. So I think once you cross the 60% occupancy at a reasonable room rate, which we're starting to see achieved now, uh, these businesses achieve now, you can see the actual operating margin open up quite nicely and produce some good earnings growth. Mm. Um, Gary, would you say that that would spur the share price onto six rand? Um, because the so one thing that to, to say this, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this, sorry, the one thing? The one thing to consider is that there's so many more shares in issue as a result of the rights offer that they had. Yeah, hundred percent. And also, like, I think that there's there's not a huge amount of institutional coverage on on City Lodge as well. So, what the market is expecting is actually very difficult to tell. Um, you know, looking at the occupancy rates, I mean, they came out uh, with uh, an update on the the twenty third of November. Uh, you know, occupancies for October were at sixty three percent. You know, at that stage in November when that came out, uh, you know, they're sitting at around sixty one percent. So, as Jared mentioned, like, kind of through that sixty percent threshold, uh, we hope they had uh, a great December and then. Uh, you know, maybe you'll see a little bit of excitement around the stock. And I think this is the type of stock that could be primed for a move. Because as I said, without the institutional coverage, and I think, you know, certainly sitting on a retail desk, you know, other than on the show, not many people ask about City Lodge, <laughs> I'm going to be honest. So, so it's, um, it's one of those, those stocks that I think it, it could quite easily sneak a really, really positive uh, you know, update into the market. So, so the, the earnings are obviously going to be released uh, on Thursday. So I think that's, okay. you know, we've got everything to play for there. And then, and then yeah, absolutely. Big, big re-rating, let's hope so. But uh, yeah, I don't know. You know Cape Town it, you know, it might feel like the, the world is turning around and business travel and conferences are back. It doesn't feel that way in Joburg. Joburg still feels very, very quiet. No, Joburg is unfortunately a big dark black pothole um but maybe the rest of the country is okay and i've just been to the kruger park and it was fabulous so you know we're just uh, we're just in our in our in our crumbling little center of decay um <clears throat> moving on i'm not going to get personal about joburg um <laughs> does berkshire hathaway still have legs to run up 13 percent year to date uh jared i don't know if this is a stock that you look at um you know it's one of the the, the phenomenal success stories of of the, I guess, the, the 20th century, 20th and 21st century, um, in terms of uh, longevity. 
Yeah, I mean, and certainly, certainly a fantastic track record uh, and a tremendous business. Um, not one I'm close to is the valuation, but what I would just comment on is clearly Apple's been a big part of the investment portfolio and driven a lot of the recent gains. I'd just be a little bit wary, just, just given how strong uh, some of the tech performance has been over the last year and a bit. I mean, you are starting to get quite demanding in terms of the valuation levels. And if there is any risk towards the broader tech space, I think Apple is, is, is a you know, firmly in that bucket. And if it does pull back, you will see a bit of pressure mm. in terms of the overall valuation. I mean, the rest of the business is it's extremely well placed. I mean, it's an excellently run insurance business. I mean, clearly there's a little bit of pressure on the reinsurance side and a lot of competition in that short term space in the US. But I think probably the concern for us would just be valuations on, on, on Apple and the broader kind of investment portfolio. Yeah, I mean, the, the chart is <clears throat> pretty astounding. Um, Gary, do you think, uh, I mean, I suppose um, Charlie Munger would have said just buy it and hold it, um, but would you just buy it now? Do you think they would be buying those shares now? <laughs> uh, it's difficult to say. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's it's been on an incredible run over, over the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, as Joe says, you know, I think what, what's Apple sitting at in their portfolio at the moment is something like 44% somewhere, somewhere around there. It's, it's absolutely massive. So, um, you know, obviously key to the drive, but there are a lot of other good quality businesses uh, within uh, that stable. I mean, from, from our preference, you know, I, I would prefer to kind of select and, and, you know, if you're building your own portfolio, you, you have the ability to access so many of those companies uh, directly because they're listed companies companies as well. So you can really get the, the kind of graduation that you want. And you're also not facing the, the, the problem that they're, they're well, if you are wonderful for you, <laughs> for most, most retail investors will be far more nimble than, than, than Berkshire Hathaway. So if you do see Apple being very expensive, you know, like a, a retail investor can easily shift out of the position, not so easy for Berkshire Hathaway, which yeah. to, to an extent is, is just tracking the market. And, and if you are going to track the market, why, why pay um, you know the, the 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 management fees within within uh, like an investment holding company like this. Why not go for a super low cost passive tracker? You can go track the market at uh, five basis points through a, a Vanguard ETF, for example. So, uh, you know, for me, yeah, generally when I see a client with, with Berkshire Hathaway in the portfolio, we kind of really have a discussion about why it's, why it's in there and what is trying to be achieved because it it does just end up being a beta play. And, and I think if you're managing your own stock portfolio or if you, you're having someone manage a stock portfolio, you're looking for a little bit more than than just buying some beta mm, okay all right let's go for some alpha um so what are your stock picks this evening uh jared uh, what takes your fancy uh, my stock pick this evening is uh, absa bank um so obviously well known to to most of the viewers um we, we think the broader uh, big four banking space looks reasonable at the moment you mean you're looking at mid uh with single digit uh, PEs across most of these stocks with reasonable earnings uh, prospects into 2024. Now, EPSA was a big laggard last year with kind of well-known issues, particularly in the rest of Africa portfolio, some of the bond write downs in Ghana, um, and, then, and then challenges in the SA portfolio as well. I mean, EPSA lent relatively aggressively in the SA retail business coming out of COVID, and you saw a bit of credit pressure emerge in their numbers uh, in the first half, as well as some of the guidance pre-close uh, into the second half. So a bit of pressure on that side, plus the rest of Africa challenges um, I mean, cause, cause a bit of the underperformance. So we just think, I mean, APSA circa 6 PE here, 8% dividend yield. There's a lot of negativity in the price at the moment. And we think we should get a, a better earnings performance mm -hmm. next year, cycling a particularly okay. low base. So a lot is in the valuation. And any uptick in the macro, if we see rate cuts come back, that, that's clearly a positive, uh, both in terms of the credit loss ratio. They're quite defensively positioned on their NIMS so are just supportive in terms of the rate decrease as well. Plus uh, cost of equity drifting lower will be positive across the bank. So we think there's good upside in a, in a normal scenario. And then if, if we do see a positive macro event, obviously very positive uh, for the banks in general. Yeah, okay. Uh, Gary, how about you? I also like Absa. That's a like it's a, it's actually one that they put out. I like that stock pick. But um, it, yeah, so so for me, I'm just going to go kind of a little bit more simple, just just on a macro view. Uh, buy growth point. Um, you know, also keeping it local, um, sort of local because uh, around only around 62 percent of their revenue is coming from South Africa at this stage. Uh, another 30 percent coming from Australia. But uh, you know, well diversified property REIT. You know, paying a, a decent distribution at the moment, and it really would be a play on interest rates. Yeah, you know, I think at the 
this stage, everyone is so pessimistic about anything to do with property, you know, internationally. But but Growth Point has you know fantastic assets uh, within the business. I mean, there's there's clearly uh, like a, a strong investment case for for investing in property through a REIT uh, rather than going and doing it direct yourself, for example. Mm. And and I think with a, if if we do go into a falling interest rate environment over the next say three years, I think you could get a material uplift in in the the the, the price of these these property REITs. And at the same time, it's paying you a distribution. You know, we, we've got it two, three years out. We're looking at, uh, you know, it'll be above 10%. So, you know, even if you don't see a, a big capital re-rating, you're still picking up a, a, a chunky distribution as well. Yeah. Okay, James. Thank you. We shall leave it there. Thanks very much for joining us this evening. Uh, Jared Houston is from All Weather Capital. Gary Boyson is from Rand Swiss. And up next, to the close. Stay with us. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.